So what is CRISPR? As we talk about uh, CRISPR-Cas technology, how can it assist the small holder farmer around the world? As most of you know, CRISPR-Cas is a uh, breakthrough in biology that helps farmers produce better and more food so that it can withstand ever-changing weather patterns, drought, uh, and diseases. These are uh, genuine uh, genome editing techniques that are based on natural systems that have been used for centuries by farmers. And uh, as farmers have selected characteristics so that they can have higher yields and uh, more nutrition in their food. So we, we are going to be talking about uh, bringing this breakthrough technology uh, that uh, is, can safely improve yields for small holder farmers. And so I want to welcome um, to our panel here, uh, Kevin Pixley, Neil Gutterson, um, and Ni Nigel Taylor, and Feng Zhan. And I want to say, welcome back to Iowa, to Dr. Zhan, who moved here and was here, as I understand it, during much of your, your uh, middle school and high school years. And some of your teachers are in the audience. So we're very pleased to have you back. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kevin uh, Pixley, who is the, um, going to moderate this panel. And we're going to be very efficient now, from now on, for the rest of the afternoon, now that Ambassador Quinn's gone. We'll do low, less on the introductions um, and look at them in your book, because then we'll have more time to hear their expertise that you came to hear about. Okay, well, thank you, and welcome to this panel discussion. I think we're going to have a, a really exciting time talking about how the technologies of CRISPR-Cas can, can be made to benefit smallholder farmers all around the world. Uh, so we're going to have a format where each of the panelists uh, will have, oh, five or six minutes to make a, an opening statement. Uh, we have a distinguished group, everything from the originators uh, of the technology, Dr. Feng Zhang, uh, through some of the uh, corporate users and, and, and developers of varieties uh, to some of the um, non-for-profit groups working on crops for uh, orphaned crops for Africa. And of course, myself, I'm Kevin Pixley. Uh, I'm the director of the Genetic Resources Program at CIMIT, which is the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. Uh, and I, I'm based in Mexico, uh, but I spent a, a large part of my career working in southern and eastern Africa uh, on maize breeding. So for me, uh, these targeted uh, genome editing technologies are, are probably the most exciting technology in genetics uh, of at least my lifetime. Uh, and so at, at least today, I have to say that. Uh, and I think there's a, a, lot, uh, a lot of optimism about what these technologies are going to achieve uh, in terms of enhancing the efficiency of plant breeding, uh, but also in terms of in enhancing food security and, and improving uh, the, the state of smallholder farmers around the world. But yet, uh, it's going to be at least a couple of decades before we really know uh, whether this optimism has been validated and has been justified. Uh, so we're going to have to wait and see uh, if we, all of us in this room and listening also uh, online, can help make this a uh, reality for smallholder farmers around the world. Uh, so we invite you to spend a few minutes with, this afternoon, with us this afternoon uh, talking specifically about how it might benefit smallholder farmers. Uh, and you're going to briefly hear from us, and then we're going to give you the opportunity to ask us uh, some questions uh, as well. But before I introduce our first speaker, uh, we have a video, which I also have not yet seen, uh, which is going to give us just a very brief introduction to what this CRISPR-Cas technology uh, is all about. So if we could have the video, please. Farmers from around the world face real challenges to producing food because plants are under constant stress from factors like climate change, drought, disease, and pests. These ever-evolving growing conditions, coupled with rapid population growth and changing diets, represent concerns about long-term food security and the preservation of our global environment. Agriculture must respond with timely solutions to these urgent needs. 
CRISPR-Cas, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, is a breakthrough in biology with broad gene editing applications for plants, animals, and humans. For agriculture, it offers a more efficient and targeted way to develop healthy seeds and help farmers produce more and better food with fewer resources. Based on a natural system, CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology can precisely improve a plant without incorporating DNA from another species. It's a continuation of what people have been doing since plants were first domesticated. Selecting for characteristics such as higher yields, tolerance to drought, longer shelf life, or better nutrition. Here's how CRISPR-Cas works. DNA is the instruction manual for the growth and development of all living organisms. In response to common internal and external stresses, breaks and repairs of DNA strands routinely happen through natural cellular processes. Over the past few decades, scientists have developed a deep understanding of the genetic and corresponding physical attributes within plants. With this knowledge, scientists can apply CRISPR-Cas to direct DNA breaks and repairs to create specific outcomes. The process is similar to how a copy editor proofs and revises an article. CRISPR-Cas reads the DNA of a particular plant. Then, based on how CRISPR-Cas is programmed, it finds a specific location in the genome and either deletes, edits, or replaces targeted genetic sequences native to the plant to create a beneficial change. CRISPR-Cas also delivers improved efficiency in healthy seed development. Using conventional plant breeding practices requires multiple cycles and years to develop a plant that grows well in certain environments and is, for example, resistant to a specific disease. Working within the existing genetic diversity of the plant family, CRISPR-Cas incorporates identified characteristics such as disease resistance directly in high-quality plants in as little as one to two cycles. This means we're able to reduce the total seed development timeline from an average of eight years to five years while maintaining the same field testing protocols. CRISPR-Cas is one more tool available to develop sustainable agricultural solutions and improve farmers' ability to produce safe, abundant, and healthy food for our dinner tables. Okay, well, if you have any questions, you'll be able to ask our first panelist. Uh, Dr. Feng Zhang uh, was one of the originators or the originator of the technology. His original paper in science has, as of 8 o'clock this morning, more than 5,000 citations. Uh, Feng Zhang is a core member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And he's also the James and Patricia Professor in Neuroscience at the McGovern Institute at MIT. He's a molecular biologist who has pioneered the development of genome editing tools based on CRISPR systems. He leverages the CRISPR mechanism and other methods to study molecular uh, and, complex and complexes of human diseases, such as psychiatric and neurological diseases. And his long-term goal is to develop novel therapeutic strategies for disease treatment. So please, Professor Zhang. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's, first of all, it's really a pleasure to be back here in Iowa. Uh, I grew up here in Des Moines. Um, uh, I went to middle school and high school here, and uh, I, it's really good to be back. I got a chance to see my teachers who are sitting in the back this morning. Um, I'm very fortunate to have been a student uh, in Iowa. Um, I'm also glad the video got an acronym out of the way. It's a mouthful. Uh, so I was worried that I might actually mess it up, so, so it's good that it got it out of the way. <coughs> so. CRISPR is what we call a gene editing system. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about how, about how this system works and why it's so exciting. Um, the genome uh, for many organisms, both our genome and also many other organisms have been completed. So we now know every single letter in the genome. The human genome, for example, has three billion letters in it. So if you think of this as, as a long document or a long book, when this document is in Microsoft Word, uh, it's fairly easy to go in and make specific changes. You can open up your search function, type in the string, and they will take you to that location in the document, and you can backspace the delete and type to add in new uh, uh, letters into that genome. Now, in the microscopic environment of the nucleus of a cell, that becomes a lot more challenging. How do you find a specific spot uh, where um, 
the gene is and, uh, to make the change when there are three billion letters uh, in this entire uh, com complicated genome. The way the CRISPR-Cas system works is that you can program a protein called Cas9, and Cas9 is the equivalent of the search function. By giving it a short RNA that's 20 letters long, 20 letters is enough to give you specificity within, say, a three billion letter long genome, then this 20 base pair RNA is the equivalent of a search string. And it, will work, and it will work with the Cas9 protein together as a machine to then search along the DNA until where these 20 letters on the RNA matches the letters on the DNA. When that happens, Cas9 will get activated and it will cut the DNA, make a severance, a double-stranded break. And you can think of this break as the equivalent of a cursor in Microsoft Word. So wherever you make the cut, that's where you can start to type to add in new sequences or you can delete uh, sequences. And so all of this really made the gene editing approach a lot easier because it's very easy to develop a 20 uh, nucleotide long RNA and to give it to the cell. So because of that, we now are able to study many genes uh, across the genome in any organism we want. And also we can study every single gene all at once to better understand biology. So for example, scientists are now able to do screens where they target every single gene and then they see which gene when you get rid of it or if you turn it on a lot more uh, can give rise to uh, virus resistance or drug resistance uh, or even drought resistance if this is done uh, in a plant species. So there's a lot of exciting opportunity to apply this technology in both human health and also in agriculture and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to participate in this panel. Okay, thank you very much. Our second panelist is Dr. Neil Gutterson. Uh, Neil is the global leader of research and development uh, for the agriculture division of Dow DuPont. He's responsible for leading all seeds and traits, crop protection, predictive agriculture, and product development functions to create innovative agricultural products. Neil also serves as president, chief executive officer, and board member of Mendel Biotechnology prior to joining DuPont Pioneer. Uh, and now he sits in Simmet's Board of Trustees, where he's program committee chair. Neil. Clicker. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. And again, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share some thoughts with, with you about moving from the technology itself to uh, the meaning of the technology, why, why it's important to us uh, broadly in agriculture and particularly with the focus on smallholder farmers. So you can see from the, the title, we think about this as bringing abundant potential to agriculture through this, this new technology. So I want to say at the beginning that CRISPR-Cas is a tool, like many tools, it can be used for many purposes. Um, and uh, for example, it can be used to actually deliver a transgene to a particular location in the genome. In that case, you have a biotech product. What I want to talk about today is not that type of application, but just the application set that we talk about as targeted breeding, a type of advanced breeding. Pioneer has been in the business of breeding and providing improved genetics for our customers, our farmers, for over 90 years. And this tool for us is just part of the continued evolution of improved breeding systems. So the new company, Dow DuPont, our, our purpose is to enrich lives of farmers, of, of those who produce and those who consume, assuring progress for generations to come. So our purpose as an organization is very much aligned with the purpose, I think, of everyone in this room, whether it's a large holder or a small holder. And these are a set of the tools that we have available to us as a new company. And you can see it's a very rich set of tools for improving not just uh, the seeds that we would deliver, but also the tools that a farmer needs to ensure the realized value of those improved seeds. Breeding has been a legacy within Pioneer, crop protection, of course, but you'll see at the top, and I've circled CRISPR, that again is, a, is linked right below breeding because for us it is part of the evolution of breeding systems. It's targeted breeding that's enabled by the CRISPR-Cas technology. So how do we see using it and how do we see this being broadly deployed? So first of all, um, the technology is in general very easy to use. And having said that, 
Um, I don't think it's as easy to engineer a rice plant or a wheat plant as going into your garage, and you might have read things like that. So um, it does take some skill and some capability, some knowledge of the genome, as uh, Fung said. Uh, if you want to edit a text, you better understand the entire text that you're going to edit. And for example, corn, roughly two and a half billion uh, characters compared to the human genome, about three billion. So these are pretty similar size. Um, and of course, the, the crops are very variable in their sizes, but these are complex to, to edit. Nonetheless, you can see for us a, a series of crops that we work on, and you can see across the top a series of the applications where we see real value to be able to um, use CRISPR in targeted breeding to edit these crops. And so you can see disease resistance is a very common problem in all these crops, crops around the world. We know a lot today about disease resistance genes. And so uh, it's the combination of what's important and what's feasible today that will direct some of our earliest applications of this technology. So disease resistance will be a key one for us, certainly improving yield and, and, and stable yield, tolerance to drought, um, and output traits. So um, certainly the ability to use this technology to improve nutrition, to develop fortified, biofortified crops, uh, improved oil seeds, improved protein content, these are also really important applications that I think are relevant to farmers around the world and certainly to smallholder farmers as they can improve the profitability of their farms by improving the output value. Now we believe that there's a lot more applications that are interesting than just those. Uh, and so we've been working to partner over the last two to three years with a range of different organizations. And so the first um, of those relationships we announced with a view on enabling benefits to smallholder farmers was with Kevin's organization, CIMIT, uh, where I do sit on the, the board of trustees. You can see on the left uh, the result of uh, infection by a de uh, devastating disease called maize le lethal necrosis disease. It's a disease caused by two viruses together. There's no good treatments for that other than genetic resistance. Uh, and CIMIT recognized that while they're developing their first generation products for resistance for the regions you can see in the map where this is really important, an important problem, that we can ultimately accelerate the delivery of improved products that are really highly performing, high yielding, and also resistant to, the, to that viral disease. And should the disease spread outside of Africa, we'll be poised to deliver solutions even faster. And so this is an example of the way we can see benefits coming and accruing to smallholder farmers in Africa as one example. Now, as I said, <clears throat> there are many different applications in a wide range of crops. There's only three on this picture. I'm not going to go through those three particularly, but in, in the case of spinach on the upper left, uh, we know there are pretty easy ways to deliver improved disease resistance. And that could lead to the reduction of use of some pretty not very pleasant um, pesticides that are currently used frequently to protect um, spinach from particular diseases. And there are a wide range of other applications. Um, I think for tomatoes, um, healthier tomatoes, more nutritious tomatoes, tomatoes with longer shelf life, just as an example. Um, and I mentioned improved oil seed. You can see perhaps solutions even in trees that can be brought. So there's a wide range, there's an abundant potential of this in all the crops we can, we can um, think of, I would say. And so as we thought about what we want to do with this technology and how we could partner with people, um, we, we decided we need to open up what we do a bit more than um, we might have in the past, although we've had a very strong collaborative ethos and partner with many people um, in, in many regions to solve smallholder farmer problems. But um, we, we believe we need to work together. Um, private companies like ours, with um, the, the CG systems, with national organizations uh, to deliver benefits. Uh, we, we announced yesterday a partnership with, uh, with the Danforth to help um, improvement of cassava and some other crops. That's the second in our, in our alliance. And we recognized recently that while we have certain really critical patent rights that uh, one would need to have um, secured in order to bring a product to the market, whether it's a commercial market or you know, a small holder market, um, that the Broad, where Fung uh, works, has another set of those patent rights that are important. And this morning we announced a joint licensing relationship to be able to create a much, much easier path and open up more democratic access to all interested parties for agriculture. 
And so the, the couple of instances so far are part of our journey to find new ways and um, really compliment you know, Fung and, his, uh, and the leaders of the Broad for working with us on bringing a single way to get access to this new and really important technology uh, to serve the developing world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Uh, now we're gonna hear from Dr. Nigel Taylor. Uh, Nigel is the Dorothy J. King Distinguished Investigator at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. He currently serves as Interim Director of the Institute for International Crop Improvement, and he's the Principal Investigator of the Virus Resistant Cassava for Africa Project. His experience is mainly on tissue culture and the genetic transformation technologies required to deliver genetically improved cassava to farmers in East and West Africa. He's a native as, of Scotland, as you're going to soon uh, hear. Uh, and if you look at his recent publications, you'll see frequently the words cassava, Africa, and smallholder farmers. So please, Nigel. Thank you. I think I'm, I'm going to stand up because I, um, I'm pretty happy to stand and move around. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you, and thank you for the introductions from the other speakers, that makes it easy for me. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of a feeling for how I see the opportunities, but also the challenges of bringing CRISPR-Cas technology um, to benefit uh, smallholder farmers. Um, and I'm talking about mostly about the orphan crops. We saw on the list from Neil the, um, the commodity crops like maize and soy and canola and um, wheat. I'm very interested in, in the orphan crops and what can CRISPR-Cas do to, to it's a completely, I think it's going to change things significantly. Um, and these are the crops, importantly, that missed out on the Green Revolution. And unfortunately, to date, they've also missed out on GM technologies. They have not been deployed. Uh, we're working on that, um, but we're way behind for, for certain reasons that we might get into. We must make sure that they don't miss out on the CRISPR-Cas revolution as well. So they're being neglected to date, but the exciting thing about them is they have huge potential because they have not undergone the, the improvement, for example, that maize has gone through or rice has gone through. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few examples of our work in cassava. We are using CRISPR-Cas technology in cassava right now, um, and we're making progress. I'm showing you here cassava brown streak disease. That's a virus disease that's epidemic in East Africa, now in Central, sorry, Central Africa, and by all accounts, the, the, the guys tell us this is going to get to West Africa and it's going to hit Nigeria. Nigeria is the largest cassava producing country in the world. There will be a food security issue when it gets there. So we've been, and this is, um, for those of you not familiar, this is a farmer holding, he's broken open the, um, the, uh, the tuber here and you can see the brown streaks. You can't eat these, you can't sell them, you can't feed them to the animal, it's a complete loss. On the panel on the left, we, uh, that is a plant in our greenhouse that has not been edited. The storage roots are damaged, you can see that. On the right, um, we have gone in and we use CRISPR-Cas technology to edit two genes, and these are by the romantic name of EIF4E genes. We, um, we, we edited two of those, and now that means that the virus cannot um, replicate properly in the plant. Um, so we're seeing very, li very little disease there and the viral load is, com is completely reduced. So this is a type of, of an example of, of, of how we could use this technology in cassava um, for brown streak disease, for bacterial disease as well. My colleague uh, Becky Bart, who I think is in the audience, she's working on, on this as well. Um, and what we, what we would do here, this has already been shown in rice to be effective. CRISPR-Cas, you modify what's called the, the sweet tan gene or the promoter of the sweet tan gene. The bacteria can no longer recognize that and it cannot um, replicate and it cannot cause disease. So we're using CRISPR-Cas technology there as well. A very, very exciting thing that, that we want to do is we would like to bring the Green Revolution to TEF um, by producing semi-dwarf TEF and we can do this by CRISPR-Cas. We know exactly the gene and the sequence. We have the sequence in TEF. We know how to do this. We just have to go ahead and do it. There are no Naturally occurring, uh, naturally occurring dwarf TEF varieties known to the breeders. So the breeders can't do this, but we can use CRISPR-Cas technology. We can go in, we can modify that gene, and we can make dwarf TEF. And that would be like almost bringing the Green Revolution to TEF. Very exciting possible application. 
So what I've mentioned to you is knocking out one or two genes at a time or modifying one or two genes, and we actually have to think bigger than that. Um, those of you who've been maybe following this, you would see a, a, a group in Spain, they, in one experiment, knocked out 35 genes, 35 of the 45 genes that make gluten in wheat. And that is incredible to me, absolutely incredible. They're going to go back now and knock out the, the remaining 45. So we have to think big um, here as well. So this means we can actually go after metabolic pathways. Neil, Neil touched on that as well. Um, so we really should think big. We're already doing targeting five genes in cassava that, um, that control flowering. So if we, can, if we can do this, then the breeders will be better able to, to manage this. Flowering is a problem in cassava, some varieties. But really, we can think about um, using CRISPR-Cas to, to take out anti-nutrients, for example, in, in sorghum and maize, cassava post-harvest deterioration, a very complex physiological response. But with CRISPR-Cas, we could target multiple genes, several pathways, and we could probably do it at the same time in one shot or two shots. So this is just some, some examples of the type of things that we can do. And another really um, interesting thing that's happening, um, and this I'll show you, these are examples in tomato, but this is also being done right now in the, um, in the lab laboratory of Joyce Van Eck at the BTI. Um, they're taking this technology and they're, they're working on Goldenberry, which is Cape Gooseberry, and they're, they're it's only semi-domesticated crop but they're going to use CRISPR-Cas to increase the branching, to make the fruits larger, to, in, to improve the, the plant habits so it's easier to cultivate. So we can imagine also doing this for orphan crops um, in Africa. And I'm not just talking about the staples, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be thinking about the, the legumes and the fruits and the vegetables, which really have, gone un, have gone, undergone very little improvement. We could bring CRISPR-Cas and fast track the domestication of these crops. So those are some of the exciting potentials, and of course we, we could talk much more about them, but there are, there are definitely ch challenges. And I'm, I'm sure those of you who have been around for a while, and I actually came to the World Food Prize in 1999, and people were saying what GM was going to deliver and how it was going to revolutionize small, smallholder farmers. Um, and of course, that has not panned out the way that, that people have said. So but there are some challenges, and we have to be aware of them. Um, we, you, we will have to develop the technology for the target crops. We will have to do the, develop the genomic platforms. We have to specifically develop the tissue culture systems, the, the type of thing that I work on to delivering um, the, the CRISPR tools so we can do this. We must train African scientists, for, for example. They must be part of this as well, and, and, and we are doing that. We would love to do more of it. I've, under, uh, I've underlined regulatory because this is really a big question, is how will the products of CRISPR-Cas technology, how will these new crops be regulated? That is not clear right now. Um, so we must engage and train with regulators, work with the stakeholders, and it's very, very important is that the African scientists and others around the world must be part of this um, conversation right now. This technology is moving so fast that they must not get left behind again. We really don't, mustn't uh, have that. So communication and education also about this new technology is, is essential. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Now, long before I was asked to be the moderator for this panel, I had been asked to speak about what CRISPR-Cas technologies will be able to and can and will achieve for smallholder farmers. So, before I do that, I thought it would be really necessary to talk a little bit more about what we mean or what we intend, what we desire in terms of impact. And I think that probably 99% of us in this room uh, would agree uh, with a shared vision where what we really want is sustainable agriculture. And we want sustainable agriculture that provides food and nutrition security for all, while enabling biodiversity conservation. And I think we would also agree that poverty alleviation and improved livelihoods for farmers uh, are also part of our shared vision. So starting from this uh, shared vision of what we all aspire to, we see CRISPR-Cas as one technology uh, that can uh, contribute uh, to achieving this. So how might it contribute? Well, it certainly could ac accelerate. We've already seen it accelerating the breeding process. And what we intend to do at CIMIT is to emphasize challenges to smallholder farmers, some of the things that, that Nigel was mentioning. These technologies can also reduce the risk of investing in technology for farmers, and not only in investing in seed, but if their varieties are more resilient to maize lethal necrosis or the cassava brown streak, then they might also invest in fertilizer or other technologies. 
These technologies, or CRISPR-Cas, might also reduce the cost of investing in this technology uh, because it is less expensive, perhaps, than some alternatives. And I think uh, Nigel's examples of uh, lodging-resistant TEF is something that might not happen if it were much more complex or much more costly uh, technology uh, required to achieve it. And one of my favorites is really that CRISPR-Cas may help us to close the technology gap between those technologies that are available to the resource-rich uh, and resource-poor farmers uh, of the world. So the only example that I'm going to tell you a little bit about that we're preparing to and beginning to work with at CIMIT is resistance to maize lethal necrosis. As, as Neil mentioned, we're working with uh, Dow DuPont Pioneer on this project. Uh, the resistance is conferred by, or largely conferred by, a gene on chromosome 6. Uh, and what we will need to do, because it's inherited in a recessive form, is we'll have to convert the susceptible allele to resistant allele in all parents uh, of a variety that we would then uh, make available to farmers. So in Africa, Eastern Africa, where this disease is the greatest concern at the moment, uh, most hybrids in use are three-way crosses, which means that we would need to then convert all three parents, inbred parents of a hybrid, uh, from susceptible to resistant allele. Uh, and this can be done quite quickly once we, ha once we have in place the methods using CRISPR-Cas. The good news also is that in, in Africa, successful hybrids typically have a long commercial life. So once we've converted some of the popular hybrids, they might have a fairly long uh, success rate and a fairly long contribution to farmers uh, in Africa. So what would come next? We could also work on rust resistant in wheat, various nutritional qualities, and probably my favorite one would be striga resistant maize, uh, where we might be able to knock out the stimulant for striga attachment uh, on maize plants. Uh, so that would be some of the possibilities that we would see coming along, uh, in addition to many of those mentioned by Nigel. Of course, I think, as, as was suggested by, our, by Nigel as well, we cannot assume that these technologies will reach smallholder farmers. Uh, at this point, I believe, if I asked my mother, she wouldn't even know what CRISPR-Cas is, or probably has never heard of it. So public opinion is largely unformed, and it's largely uninformed about CRISPR-Cas and the regulatory framework is largely undefined, which is a great opportunity for us to help form it uh, in a way that will make these technologies available uh, to smallholder farmers. I think if CRISPR-Cas technology, and I put it in parentheses because if any uh, advanced and beneficial technology does not reach smallholder farmers, then we risk really increasing that technology lag and decreasing the competitiveness of smallholder farmers and further then enhancing the poverty cycle that of course we're all working uh, to alleviate. So how can we, as a scientific community, help to ensure that the technological options or the technological prospects and, and optimism about CRISPR-Cas does have positive impacts on smallholder farmers? I, I think we, we need to begin by recognizing and respecting the sovereignty of every country to decide if and when and how they're going to use uh, this technology. I think we have a, a great responsibility to provide accurate, complete, and trustworthy information to the public uh, and to the regulatory process. We also, of course, need to implement excellent safety and stewardship in our research of CRISPR-Cas and other advanced technologies. I think we also have a role, and part of it is for uh, like this one, to advocate for equity in the access to the possible benefits of this and other technologies. So at CIMIT, we work to keep or to try to secure or obtain access to CRISPR-Cas, put it in, bring it into the public domain uh, so that it can benefit uh, smallholder farmers. And of course, we need to offer capacity development in the effective use of this technology. So coincidentally, I work for CIMIT and our mission statement is maize and wheat science for improved livelihoods. And we work on everything from agronomy through socioeconomics, through value chains, and of course, we do a lot of plant breeding. And within our toolbox for plant breeding, we are beginning to use uh, CRISPR-Cas. We, don't, we know that it's not going to be a magic bullet, as no technology will be, uh, but we also think it's unethical to dismiss any technology without responsibly considering its possible contributions. So, as I said, I'm wearing two hats this afternoon.
I think we've done a reasonable time of managing our time, so we will invite questions from the audience. But before I do that, I tried to prepare one question for each of our speakers. And, and I'd like to start with, with Nigel. Uh, I know that one of the things that will help the, the public in general to accept this and other technologies is a success that actually benefits consumers, that benefits society in general. So what do you think in Africa might be the first success using CRISPR-Cas to deliver products to consumers? Well, I, I think the TEF example is a really good one, I think because it's, um, it's technologically simple to do. And I think it's, it's, very, it's very visible, very visual. Um, so I, I think that's, that would be the top of my list. I mean, when we, when we get into disease resistance, for example, with cassava, um, that, that's a harder one, and you'd have to do multi-locational appeal trials, and it, it, takes, it takes longer. So to keep my answer succinct, I would go with the TEF. I want to start that next week. <laughs> We look forward to eating, <laughs> eating more TEF at well, a I'll better. I'll take that opportunity to say as well that, uh, that the, the collaborative agreement we now have with um, Dow DuPont um, is going to be a really important component of that. So we could take this on ourselves and go with it, but it, 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 would, be, um, it would be challenging. But with the, with the expertise that is available through this collaboration, I believe that we can do um, and the excellent technology but that we will now be able to, to take and adapt to TEF. I, I believe that we can do this really quickly. I see that we have one person at the microphone. I'll come to you in just a moment, but if anybody else has a question, please begin to approach the microphones. And in the meantime, uh, Neil, uh, you talk about using this technology for genome editing and targeted breeding, but what do you think is gonna be its impact on genetic diversity? Well, thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, I think the issue of genetic diversity is, is an important one that um, we retain diversity in our cropping systems. Uh, we've invested a lot as a community in, in germplasm banks that have, uh, whether it's potato or rice or wheat or maize, and uh, we, we tap into that diversity, and I think the MLN's a good example, when a problem arises or there's a new target to be addressed. But when you take a, an elite variety and then take a, a very foreign, unrelated variety and try to bring in the value of that trait, it can really slow down the breeding process. And so by being able to actually go in and interrogate in the germplasm banks, a partic find particular genes that deliver that particular outcome and just swap in the right allele into that elite variety, directly into the elite variety, we can actually get much greater use of the diversity that exists in all our germplasm banks. So I think if you look forward the next few years, if things work well, the value of our germplasm banks will actually be greatly enhanced by uh, the use of uh, CRISPR-Cas um, targeted breeding technology. I think that's really exciting. Great, thanks. And, and Feng, uh, you work mostly in CRISPR applications for human diseases. Uh, I'm wondering if in your community you face similar discussions about how these technologies can reach the intended publics and, and what you might be able to tell us you've learned uh, from those discussions that might inform us. Um, certainly. Um, so CRISPR is, is a very broad technology. There's application in, in human health, in basic science research, and in agriculture. And so in all the applications related to human health, there are a lot of discussions about uh, how do we think about translating this into uh, therapeutics, or how do we turn this into a way so that we can very rapidly understand disease mechanisms so that we can uh, develop drugs based on understanding the disease and then going after the root cause. And so there's a lot of discussion around that. And one of the important things from some of those discussions really has been that the recognition that CRISPR is such a fundamentally important tool. And because it's so broadly reaching, it's important to make sure that it's accessible. Uh, the technology is usable by researchers um, you know, around the world who want to use this to advance our understanding of biology and human health and also agriculture. And so that's why we're really excited to have the opportunity to work with DuPont Pioneer to reach this agreement to really make the, the intellectual property for the CRISPR technology openly accessible to any agricultural application so that as many people as possible can benefit from, from the positive use and also the broad potential of this technology. And, and the same uh, is happening in the research area as well. And we've been trying to provide um, sort of non-exclusive licenses to many different parties uh, whoever wants to use this to be able to advance the understanding of biology 
uh, advancement of human health. And I think that's, that's really one of the, the things that the whole field is recognizing as an important thing to do. Thank you very much. All right, we have just over 12 minutes for questions from the audience, and so I'm gonna ask you to briefly state who you are and then your question as succinctly as possible. And we'll take, I think, three questions in a row and then we'll have the panel answer those questions before uh, returning for more questions. And I, I'd like to start with the young lady over here on my right. Thanks for calling me, Yang. My name is Dorothy Masinde. I teach at Iowa State University and my field is sociology and international development. And in Uganda, we work with small-scale farmers uh, in deep rural villages of Uganda. This is a good technology that can help Africa and Uganda in particular. I'm wondering, are you talking to the eventual users of this technology and making this, uh, trans translating everything into a language that the people we work with who are the politicians who are going to be a roadblock to you are transferring this technology to the people and using a language they're going to be able to understand so that they don't fight you back. Having social scientists in the research station is good, but you need to work with the people who are working on the ground. We start understanding what this is all about so that when you bring this technology, we don't fight you back. We are sociologists and we're waiting for you. Thank you very much. Let's, let's take a question from the gentleman on my left. Uh, Dr. Alan Koslow, I'm a community activist and I also do international medical missions and I'm actually here at this covering this for one of the local newspapers as a columnist. And my question uh, first to Nigel is how long and how expensive was it to do that change in cassava? And, is, and to Kang, is it more difficult to know which gene and what the gene does or is it more difficult to make the change in the gene? Okay, thank you. And let's take one more question before we go to answers. Yeah. I'm Juliana Rueramira, uh, Managing Director for Sasakawa Africa Association and we work with smallholder farmers of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa mainly. My question is uh, to ask whether the benefits of this very uh, important technology would will benefit uh, the post-harvest activity. For example, African farmers are not only faced with production diseases, but in storage, they lose the crop to aflatoxins. They cannot use what they have stored for eating or for sale in the market because the quality has gone down. Uh, I think uh, since you are still in the breeding stage, maybe you should consider that area as well. Okay, thank you very much. We'll come back for more questions, but let's uh, hear from the panelists uh, some answers. Maybe, uh, Nigel, would you like to start uh, the specific questions on cassava? Uh, I'd like to answer the first question, on it, if, I, if I can. Um, so, and I can't see the, the lady that asked the question, but, um, Hi there. <laughs> um, so specifically, the, I showed you the flowering in cassava. That was done by a Ugandan scientist working in our lab. Um, and and he, did, he, he did that whole thing, five genes um, to improve uh, flowering in cassava. So I think it's really important that, for example, the Ugandan scientists are doing this and understand the technology and then are able to go back and, and talk about it. So to, to answer your question directly, no, we are not talking to the end users about this technology, um, not yet. We are talking um, to the National Agricultural Research System, um, the guys at NACRI, um, Namalongi, that, that we collaborate with, our partners there. But we, you are absolutely correct, we must start to, to do that. This is all very new. Everything I told you about, we've only done, we published our first paper last week on CRISPR-Cas technology and cassava. The flowering is new. Everything is really new to us as well. But that's why I put at the end, communication, really important. I think Neil wants to follow up on that one, right? Let me add a comment to that before you come to the other cassava part of the question. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, a couple of things are really important here, I think. First of all, um, language is, does matter, right? The words we use, what resonates with people. We may think we're saying something, but someone hears something else. Something might be frightening to someone and to us it's comfortable. 
So we think a lot about the right language, how to talk about the technology, how to talk about the products, how to talk about the benefits, um, and put that in some context that's meaningful. So we've spent a lot of time um, listening to people, holding um, you know, stakeholder conversations around the world uh, in many continents to start to truly understand, share, but to truly listen and understand what our, uh, people feel about the technology as well and products of the technology. The, the, the last comment about that is that ultimately it's about trust. I mean, we need to get to a point of, of a trusted relationship with the end user. So we are talking to the end user. I mentioned the companies focus on farmers, but also on the end consumer. And we know that today, um, and someone said it, you know, the farmer may want technology, but if the consumer doesn't want the product, the farmer has no technology to get access to. So we know that's an important part of it. And I think it's an interesting catch-22. At some level, you, it's a tendency to hold back and not use the technology, let it play out. But I think if people, like the folks in this room, see it as a really important technology that can bring value and begin to use it, then I think there's a greater chance to build trust. Um, because inherently, I think the world would look in this room and um, probably look at me and think I'm the last person to be trusted, whether that's right or wrong, because I come from a big multinational company. Okay, let's, let's tackle question number two, which is about how long and expensive the work on cassava uh, was. Uh, specifically, do you mean, the, for example, the brown streak disease? Right. Um, so the first time you do something, it's really hard. Um, and it takes longer. But we're past that now into, into so we could go, we're, we're going to, we edited two of the genes for the, for the Brown Street resistance. We're going to edit now the remaining five. That'll take us about um, five, five or six months to get the plants. We know exactly what we're going to do. We start it, well, five or six months to get the plants. I have not costed it out. <laughs> um, so I can't answer that question right now. I could probably make an estimate for you and we could talk afterwards. It's, it, is, it is not, it's not, it's not crazy expensive. Okay, let's, uh, anybody have an answer to the question about post-harvest? Anybody aware of targets on post-harvest? You know, there's certainly, it, it, there's no question that uh, people have looked at ripening kind of issues which lead to senescence, right? and decay, and so there's, there's a lot of interest in reducing waste by addressing those kinds of issues for produce, there's no question. Uh, the specific targets on a crop-by-crop -crop basis and the types of challenges um, need to be a deep, deeper conversation uh, to be had, but certainly it's an area of, of great interest as well. Uh, well I would we certainly recognize the value and the importance of, of targets on, on post-harvest, and I'm not aware of anybody working on it now, but that doesn't mean it's not happening, and, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear from somebody in this room that, yeah, we're, we're working on that uh, in one of our crops. So thanks for those questions. I see we have lots of questions, and we have four more minutes. Uh, so we'll start on the left, and then we'll take a couple questions from the right, and I'm sorry we may not have time for all the questions this afternoon. Um, my name is Marceline Egden, and I come from Tuskegee University. I have a question and a comment. Nigel, I was hoping to hear cassava because it benefits everybody in Africa. TEFE is kind of limited to Ethiopia in a way, although it's gaining uh, momentum with the uh, vegetarian industry in America. My question is, we are all excited about uh, CRISPR. At Tuskegee, we have utilized it to edit the phytoem desaturase gene in sweet potato, a hexaploid crop. We are all excited, but I think we are going to make the mis same mistake we made with the transgenic era. We have to start to talk to the public, to educate, to have education. I know you have touched on it a little bit, but we have to have another strategy. You know, as scientists, I can see it, but as a lay person, how do I see it? I'm being sold a lot of uh, opportunity. It's gonna benefit the farmer, it's gonna do that. We need an integrated and a sustainable education now, not talking among us scientists, but make sure that we don't make the mistake of uh, non-acceptance and perception that we have with the transgenic era. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think we'll only have time for one more question. So apologies to everyone else who would like to, but you can approach us afterwards if, if you have time. And let's just take one more question, and then we'll, we'll get some answers, and we need to wrap up. Um, first of all, thank you for accepting my question. Um, I am Erin May, a fifth-generation Kansas farmer. My research for the GYI, I was accepted to come here from Kansas, and my research was on plant science in Ethiopia utilizing CRISPR. My question is, some people are anti-technology or they're uninformed of technology. How can we give them positive reinforcements of the use of CRISPR while telling them what the negative repercussions and effects might be, giving them a positive aspect? Okay, thank you. Maybe, Fung, would you like to try to answer these questions? Sure, um, I'll try, and, and please feel to, to uh, jump in. Um, I think both the questions are, are a little related, uh, which sort of underscore the importance of communication, um, underscore the importance of um, getting, the right getting the right information, getting um, the public to really understand what the technology is about, what the strength of the technology is, where we are, and then what are the challenges that uh, remain uh, that we need to solve with the technology. And so I think as, as the whole community, um, as scientists, as well as policymakers and uh, application scientists and, and developers, uh, farmers, um, as a community together, I think we all have a responsibility to, to get sufficient information and get the right information so that people have a full understanding of what the technology is. We face this not only in agriculture, but very much so uh, in therapeutic applications as well. Um, applications of technology for treating uh, diseases at, at different uh, stages. So, so it's not an easy thing to do, but I think if we all do our part and, and we try to, um, to communicate things in a clear and, and um, responsible way, um, that will pave, pave a long way for, for what we're trying to do. Feel, feel, feel free to add to that. No, I, I think that's, that's, that's key. I, I think we need to certainly start by focusing on the really meaningful benefits. You know, you think about therapeutics, and you get a benefit of a life-saving application, no one's gonna question, people will then question what the risks are, but you gotta get interest in the benefits. And I think the same thing's true for agriculture. What are the really compelling benefits? And, and there are a number. And then we need to talk honestly about what, what the risks are. So, you know, whether it's on websites that provide information or other kinds of dialogues, we, we helped sponsor an event called CRISPRCon a couple of months ago, brought together many, many different voices about the, the issues that might concern people about the uh, products of this technology coming to the market. So we need to have those events continue. Well, I, I'm afraid our time is up. It's, it's really, uh, our, we've consumed our time, and I think we're going to have to cede the, the podium to someone else. But I'd really like to thank everyone for the, the excellent questions, for your attention, for your interest in this exciting technology. Uh, and let's thank the speakers one more time. That was very interesting. The potential, I think we would all say to you all, is, um, is very exciting and the speed is breathtaking. <laughs>